patients. There are both advantages and disadvantages, speaking kind of towards the end of a seminar. One of the great things is I get to build on what everyone else has said. So occasionally, for those of you who've been here since about 9.30 this morning, you'll hear a little bit of repetitiveness, or think of it more as review for what we've done earlier. At the same time, there's a possibility that moving towards the end of a rich but also a very packed day, that some of us might be running a little bit low on stamina. So as a result, I've prepared about 30 minutes or so of more formal remarks, and this puts a little bit more responsibility on you, which is what I'm hoping is that that leaves us a good 15 or 20 minutes to talk a little bit more interactively. Now, that only works if you do not fall asleep and if you're ready to kind of engage in more of a conversation of this, and that also could very much segue into kind of our final wrap-up session after this. So again, to kind of give you a preview of the dynamic, that hopefully we'll be able to get to. So as I look back at what we've done today, in some ways I do go back in my mind to how Philip introduced us to this topic. Mm -hmm. That is, is seeing that much of our focus as a seminar has been what happens to the world if we essentially change our maps. That is, how does our understanding of early Christianity change if instead of seeing late ancient Christianity as a religion solely of a Mediterranean basin, we start expanding it to include northern Mesopotamia? What happens to our understanding of medieval Christianity when instead of using a map centered around Rome, we center it around Baghdad? What if we extend it to include the full extent of the Church of the East, as several of our speakers have been coming back to, that huge geographical swath, which reminds us that centering just on the European basin is giving us only the smallest sliver of Christian history. The result of this shifting viewpoint isn't, however, simply geographical expansion. It's not just simply that Christianity was actually bigger than we thought it was before. Instead, by fully including in our analysis communities that previous generations of scholars have excluded, we often obtain radically different results on some of the, per the topics that are core topics of church history. Now, there is perhaps no topic where this has a greater effect than on the history of Christian-Muslim relations. And the reason for this becomes apparent when we look at another map. For when Christians first encountered Muslims, and when Muslims first encountered Christians, those Muslims were not first meeting Latin-speaking Christians from the Western Mediterranean, or Greek-speaking Christians from Constantinople, but rather that branch of Christianity we've been focusing on today Christians from northern Mesopotamia, who in the earliest encounters with Muslims were initially speaking this dialect of Aramaic called Syriac. Now these Syriac Christians were under Muslim rule from the 7th century up to the present day. They wrote our earliest and our most extensive accounts of Islam, and they described a complicated set of religious interactions and cultural exchanges that are not reducible to the solely antagonistic. You'll hear me come back to this many, many times. I want us to think beyond the dichotomy that either Christians were in a clash of civilizations with Muslims, or that they all were around the campfire singing Kumbaya with each other. And one of the challenges is how do we get such a complicated set of material and how might that change our perception of what are the earliest encounters of what eventually becomes the world's two largest religious traditions. Nevertheless, because so few scholars, and again, Baylor is really the exception to this, so it's harder for you to understand this, but <clears throat> so few scholars read Syriac, that there's been little analysis of these sources. And so as a result, most historical reconstructions of Christian-Muslim relations, especially their earliest strata, exclude from consideration 
the largest set of Christian writings about Islam. Instead, scholarly reconstructions of these first encounters most commonly focus upon works whose martial context often reinforces an oppositional model of interreligious encounter. Now, I'm not saying that Greek and Latin texts were unanimous about how they depicted Islam, nor am I suggesting we should be examining them less. Nevertheless, due to most historians' linguistic training, there remains a notable bias as to which sources scholars privilege when they investigate early Christian reactions to Muslims. But members of the Syriac churches had a very, very different experience of Islam than did most early Greek and Latin Christians. As you've heard allusions to throughout our talks today, in the first Islamic centuries, Syriac Christians held key governmental posts in the Islamic Empire. They attended the Caliph's court in Baghdad. They collaborated with Muslim scholars to translate Greek science and philosophy into Arabic. They accompanied Muslim leaders on their campaigns against the Christian Byzantine Empire. And they helped fund monasteries through donations from Muslims, including money from the Caliph himself. Syriac Christians ate with Muslims, they married Muslims, they bequeathed their estates to Muslim heirs, they taught Muslim children, they were soldiers in Muslim armies. And so what I want us to ask is how the history of Christianity's relationship with Islam changes if instead of relying on writings from Christians who often met Muslims on the battlefield, one focuses on Syriac Christians who inhabited a world where they had daily interactions with Muslims and a much more direct knowledge of Islam than did most Western Christians. Now, my own work tries to synthesize about 50 or 60 Syriac documents that were written between the mid-7th and the 9th century CE. For fairly obvious reasons, that is, so we get out before midnight, today I want to focus on only five of them. Now, I've chosen these five sources, which I've nicknamed the Family Bible, the Doomsayer, the Lawmaker, the Diplomat, and the Storyteller, mm -hmm. because they resist attempts to make a linear or an overly facile narrative and it is this diversity of Syriac Christian perspectives on Islam that I find to be one of the most important antidotes to a myth of continued, unending, inevitable clash between Christians and Muslims. So let's begin with the earliest, in some ways the most dramatic, and certainly among the ugliest images in today's presentation. The manuscript British Library Additional 14461, you don't need to memorize that, is a beautiful 6th century biblical codex. But this afternoon, we're really not going to focus on the pretty parts of the book, like those pages. For in the 7th century, this book functioned somewhat analogous to a modern family Bible. That is, just as in the present day, many printed Bibles begin with a few extra pages to include personal information like marriages, baptisms, and the like, so too many ancient biblical manuscripts. Thus, this manuscript originally had a blank page at the front of the Bible. Now, in the year 637 CE, just a couple of years after the death of the prophet Muhammad, a Syriac writer used this extra space to compose an eyewitness report to the Islamic conquests. The result is the earliest surviving text about Islam. But like most ancient codices, at some point, this book lost its cover. And as this picture results, 
the, the, sees the result of this, which is that the surviving note is very poorly preserved. Now, as an indicator of how infrequently Syriac texts are consulted, to the best of my knowledge, there are only five people alive today who have looked at the world's earliest manuscript page mentioning Islam. But when I was at the British Library the other summer, the Library's Conservancy Department helped me analyze this document using multispectral imaging. And as you can see in the composite image, the results are at least a little bit clearer than simply using natural light. So too, with the help of image processing algorithms originally developed to analyze the spotting patterns of frog skin, I'm not making that up, <laughs> was able to bring out some additional details. Now, the detailed analysis shows that the surviving text twice refers to Muhammad. It also speaks to Arabs, of Arabs to town surrendering to substantial Byzantine casualties. In this way, this, this, um, excuse me, this family Bible in many ways foreshadows characteristics found throughout the first decades of Syriac writings on Islam. Like the writer of this note, mid-7th century Syriac authors knew about Muhammad, but they never spoke of their conquerors having anything close to what we would think of as a religion. Once we leave this family Bible behind, we need to move forward 50 years to the next two sources we're going to talk about today, the doomsayer and the lawmaker. Now, at this point, things have changed dramatically. After the conclusion of the Second Arab Civil War in the 690s, the Caliph Abd al-Malik consolidated the first Islamic dynasty. In the early 690s, Abd al-Malik also instituted a program of Islamization, which publicly proclaimed Islam as a supersessionary religion to Judaism and Christianity. This can be seen, for example, in changes in Islamic coinage. Previous Islamic authorities most often minted coins that followed the Byzantine or Persian coin type. For example, note these beautiful Byzantine coins on the left. They show a picture of the Byzantine emperor Heraclius and his son, and a picture of the cross on the other side of the coin. Now, examine these mid-7th century imitation Byzantine coins. Although these coins were minted under the Islamic Empire, under the authority of the Caliph, they too preserved imagery of Byzantine emperors and even the cross. Now, further east, consider this early 7th century Persian coin. The Sasanian king of kings is on the front, and a Zoroastrian fire temple is on the back. Now, below is an imitation Sasanian coin that looks almost identical, though it was minted by Islamic authorities decades later. It preserves not only the Zoroastrian fire temple, but even the reignal year of the last Persian king, who'd been dead for decades by the time you actually printed this coin. Now, in other words, for decades, the Islamic government is coining money that has Christian crosses or Zoroastrian fire temples on it. In the early 690s, this key Umayyad caliph, Abd al-Malik, began to change the coinage. He begins to experiment with it. So, for example, Byzantine um, imitation coins now remove the crossbar from the cross. And so the new Islamic issue has a less offensive pull. He literally just takes a little bit away from the coin die. A few years later, Abd al-Malik, not always, let's just say he wasn't always low on self-esteem decided to put a picture of himself on the front of the coin. And then in the late 690s, 
he eventually replaces all iconographic imagery with Arabic writing that often included a Muslim confession of faith or anti-Trinitarian <clears throat> verses from the Quran. That is, in the late 690s, every time you looked for change in your purse, you would see evidence of substantial changes in the religious and political environment. Even more dramatic, in the 690s, Abd al-Malik built the monumental Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. This, too, included inscriptions with anti-Trinitarian statements. Such developments drove Syriac Christians bonkers. You see, in the early 7th century, the Islamic conquests were just simply one of a series of military invasions in the Middle East. In the first four decades of the 7th century, these Christians' land has changed ownership four times, the Byzantines to the Persians, the, and then the Byzantines to the Arabs. Initially, there was no reason to suggest that Arab control of the area would be any longer lasting than that of their predecessors. The Arabs certainly weren't going to be around long enough to worry about their religion. Yet suddenly, now in the 690s, everything has started to change. Everything's beginning to point to a much different, much more religiously inflected, and potentially much longer lasting situation. And it is at this time that from the perspective of Syriac sources, Muslims essentially got religion. Now, because of this moment's import, we're going to linger here just a bit and look at two late 7th century Syriac writers. The first, who I've named the Doomsayer, is more commonly known as Pseudo-Methodius, most likely in responses to the events of the early 690s. An anonymous Syriac Christian wrote a series of visions he falsely attributed to the early 4th century Christian martyr Methodius, quickly translated into Greek, Armenian, Slavonic, and Latin, it soon became an international bestseller. And excerpts of its prophecies regarding Islam's imminent demise were even printed in Vienna during the Turkish siege of 1683. That's how popular these visions from the late 7th century war. Nevertheless, despite its popularity, this is far from an uplifting text. To get a quick overview of its content, peruse this colorful word cloud that indicates frequency by font size. More common the word, larger the font. Note the prevalence of terms like devastated, chastisement, destruction, this is not nice bedtime reading. The doomsayer also applies equally impassioned imagery to his conquerors, characterizing them as barbarian tyrants, rebels, murderers, bloodshedders, annihilators who are not men but children of destruction. The doomsayer predicted that the sons of Ishmael would wage war against the Byzantines, destroy the Persians, decimate the Christians, and caused many Christians to deny their faith. But Pseudo-Methodius emphasized that despite all evidence to the contrary, Muslims would not be around for very long. They were simply God's tool to chastise Christians and to separate the truly faithful from the faithless. Any day now, according to this author, God will rise up the last king of the Greeks, who will defeat the Muslims and usher in a brief period of unparalleled peace before the world's imminent end. It turned out he was wrong. But when it became clear that the world's end wasn't happening anytime soon, Syriac apocalyptic hopes quickly fizzled. Syriac Christians realized they had to now deal with Muslim neighbors who were not going away anytime soon. 
Contemporary writings not only show how Christians negotiated this increasingly pluralistic environment, they also document an ongoing debate between those who wanted to shore up confessional distinctions and those less concerned with a clear divide between Christian church and Muslim community. Consider the third author we'll look at today, the lawmaker, more commonly known as Jacob of Edessa. Ordained a bishop in the year 684, Jacob gained a reputation for being a stickler of church regulations. Frustrated at his contemporaries' disregard for ecclesiastical rule, led him to eventually resign being bishop, retire to a neighboring monastery, and, while there, write yet more legal decisions. <coughs> Jacob's writings reflect, however Im imperfectly, a messy world in which people and objects frequently cross confessional boundaries. Consider the following case. Jacob's friends ask him what he should do with a Christian woman who is married to a Muslim husband who threatens to kill a priest if the priest doesn't give the Muslim's Christian wife the Muslim's Christian wife the Eucharist. That's not only a mouthful, you kind of need a diagram to follow it all. Here the lawmaker clearly witnesses on the ground blurring between these communities. He presents a story about intermarriage, and even more challenging to modern notions of clear religious boundaries, a Muslim who is clearly invested in making sure that his wife receives the Christian Eucharist. Now, in another letter, the lawmaker states that when in Byzantine territory, some Muslims had stolen the Christian Eucharist from the Byzantines. Once they got back to Muslim territory, they felt so bad about this that they brought the pilfered elements to Jacob, who in turn sent them to the nearest Byzantine church. I have no idea what we're supposed to do with something like that. Now let's add other decisions such as closing church doors prior to the Eucharist so that Muslims might not enter and mingle with, with believers, discussions about whether a Christian abbot can accept a dinner invitation from a Muslim rule, ruler, Jacob encouraging priests to accept hire as teachers of Muslim children, a ruling that priests can exercise demon-possessed Muslims and even use a mixture of holy water and relics to perform such healings. This intermingling becomes so prevalent that the lawmaker must even rule that a cloth embroidered with a, quote, Muslim confession of faith could not be used as a Christian altar covering. Now, this fuzziness of boundaries between early Christianity and early Islam <laughs> did not end in the 7th century. Now consider the diplomat, who you've already heard a fair amount about today. This is the guy better known as Timothy I, the head of the East Syrian church from 780 to 823. So now we're towards the end of the 8th century, the beginning of the 9th century. And as head of the world's largest church, Timothy attended the court of four Muslim caliphs and, with their support, helped expand the Syriac churches throughout the Middle East into India, Afghanistan, Tibet, and China. The diplomat was also personally commissioned by the caliph to translate Aristotle into Arabic and once even accompanied the caliph on a military campaign against the Byzantines. In a lengthy letter, recounting an audience that he had had with the caliph, Timothy shares with caliph some of his thoughts about Muhammad. According to Timothy, Muhammad is worthy of all praise from all rational people. 
For he walked on the road of the prophets, he journeyed on the path of the lovers of God. For if all the prophets taught about one God, Muhammad taught about one God, then it's evident that Muhammad also walked on the path of the prophets. That's kind of that eighth grade axiom of transitive properties going on here. Now, in addition to flashbacks of eighth grade geometry, it's also a great example of realpolitik. But nonetheless, the diplomat remains uncompromising on one crucial issue. However much he may have walked on the roads of the prophet, Timothy himself was darn sure that Muhammad was not himself a prophet. Using his knowledge of Arabic, the diplomat even cites a number of Quranic passages to prove Muhammad's belief in Christ. For example, Timothy quotes verses in the Quran that use the first person plural to speak of God. According to Timothy, these we passages are a reference to God and Christ. And so too, Timothy correctly points out that several Quranic chapters begin with a series of mystical, untranslatable letters. Timothy incorrectly states that these always appear in groups of three so that he can claim that they are secret references to the Christian trinity. According to Timothy, in Muhammad's day, the Arabs could not handle the truth. That is, they're so used to polytheism, they would have misinterpreted the trinity as paganism. So Muhammad, according to Timothy, as a good crypto-Christian, encoded such knowledge in the Quran for future generations. Now, as a historian, I'm very suspicious that this is actually what Muhammad did in the 7th century, and this certainly is not going to be persuasive to many Muslims at the time period. But notice Timothy's project of trying to appropriate the Quran that now he can read since he's bilingual in Arabic, and try to use it to claim that Muhammad was just a good Christian apostle who kind of had a Bible code he put in the Quran that now only Syriac Christians can find the truth and tell everyone what Islam is all about. Again, it's somewhere in between apologetic and polemic, but it's a very different sort of argument than what we find among more Western Christian sources. Now, a few decades after the diplomat's death, appears the final author that we will look at today, the storyteller. Around the year 860, a bishop known as Thomas of Marga decided to write the world's longest alumni newsletter. <laughs> that is, Thomas compiled thousands of anecdotes celebrating the miraculous deeds of graduates from his home monastery. Amid the storyteller's numerous tales containing teleporting trees, a temporarily resurrected dog, and a petrified dragon, appear about a dozen Muslim characters. These individuals have only bit parts in the narrative. Nevertheless, they reveal important information for how a mid-9th century Christian bishop might depict Islam to his readership. Consider, for example, Timothy's story of Mar Syriacus, who took control of Thomas's monastery just as the monastery was going bankrupt. No one knew how Mar Syriacus would pay off the monastery's debt until a philanthropically minded Muslim just happens to arrive on the scene. The Muslim was the ideal candidate to bail out the monastery. According to the storyteller, this Muslim's faith was, quote, quote, close to ours. He had made previous donations to monasteries. He was very rich and best of all. His only son was suffering from a fatal illness. The storyteller wastes no time. By the chapter's fourth sentence, the Muslim had a vision of Syriacus, who sent holy water to the Muslim son who drank it and instantly was healed. The Muslim immediately paid off the monastery's debt 
and for good measure donate an additional 2,000 zuzim to the monastery. Thomas, the author of this story, relentlessly moves on to his next anecdote. We, however, might wish to pause and ask, does such a man fit comfortably within our definition of a Muslim? Few 21st century Christians would anticipate a Muslim funding Christian religious institutions, consulting Christian clergy for spiritual aid, or using Christian holy water. But as the storyteller's other anecdotes attest, such a character was quite at home in the 9th century. Also consider Thomas's stories of a Christian holy man exercising a Muslim woman possessed by Arabic-speaking demons, a Muslim fisherman calling upon the name of a Christian saint to help fill his nets with fish, or a Christian congregation that confessed Christ to be a mere human being and simply like one of the other prophets. With the help of a family Bible, the doomsayer, the lawmaker, the diplomat, and the storyteller, we have traversed, trans, excuse me, traversed two, thousand, two centuries of Syriac Christian reactions to Islam in 27 minutes. Even more, even when limiting ourselves to only five sources, we encountered an amazingly diverse and complex set of reactions to Islam. How much more if we were to increase our sample size? For example, what about adding the Kinesha fragment, a tale of a group of demon-possessed monks who were successfully exercised by a Muslim governor using a splinter from Jesus' true cross. Mm -hmm. Or the history of Robin Hormiz, where a temporarily resurrected prostitute and a magically talking baby helped convince a Muslim governor to convert to Christianity. What about the letters of Ishiab III documenting Muslim support for Christian monasteries? Or the Chronicle of 724, where a Christian scribe refers to Muhammad as God's messenger. Then add the Syriac Bahira legend that lampoons the prophet in the Quran, considered to the rulers of the world, presents a template for how to write a polite and politique letter to a Muslim governor, or on the entrance before a new emir that instructs you how to pray for your Muslim governor. Compare to the Chronicle of Zukni which presents a seemingly endless list of atrocities suffered under Muslim rule, but whose biggest complaint is that corrupt Islamic officials are equally mean to their fellow Muslims. So the author can't claim a religious persecution and hence can't claim that he's found for himself some new martyrs. Or consider 9th century canon law against congregation members who became circumcised like Muslims, but still wanted to be considered Christian. This incredible diversity of Syriac Christian discussions of Muslims, ranging from overtly antagonistic to downright friendly, makes it really difficult to construct an easy to summarize presentation. But it does make it very easy to contest any depiction of a monolithic Christian reaction to Islam. Even more challenging to reductionist models of interreligious encounters is the amorphous nature of what we call Islam. As we've often seen, even in just these five sources today, <coughs> Syriac texts constantly suggest that in the first centuries after Muhammad's death, there was much greater hybridity and overlap between the categories Christian and Muslim than is commonly acknowledged. Now, for those who study the history of interreligious encounters, such results should not be surprising. Nevertheless, in recent years, the increasing dominance of a conflict model of Christian-Muslim relations 
has effectively drowned out most other perspectives. And it is here where these Eastern Christian sources are so valuable. They show that for centuries, Christianity and Islam exhibited way too much permeability, interdependence, and convergence to be defined as firmly bound independent entities, to say the least as inevitably clashing civilizations. So thank you. So since we have uh, a few minutes, right. I'll uh, just get you to uh, take questions. Wonderful, and, please. Will you take them yourself? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, any questions, please. So remember, this was your responsibilities. <laughs> so someone please start us out. This, by the way, is just a, uh, a, a, a trivia point. Uh, one of the oldest known English coins from the 750s from a Christian king uh, is actually taken from an Islamic coin, and it has on it the back in uh, these very pretty decorations, which actually spell out there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Do, so, uh, do, do you think they even knew what they had on the not coin? A not a clue. Not a clue. In this case, it's fairly clear the Muslims' authorities actually did know. I mean, the picture of the sure. cross is pretty darn obvious. Yeah. Right. But they didn't care for a while, and part of it is the conservation with money. Um, I did this actually with a class of mine on, on Monday. We were looking at ancient um, Hellenistic and Jewish coins. And one thing that's amazing is you look at an ancient coin and you instantly know what it is. Hey, that's a coin. That is it's so remarkably similar and has been conserved over thousands of years. In antiquity, this is particularly important because coins are valued by their metal content. But you can't always assay that. And so what you need is a coin that looks familiar enough to you that you trust it. And so changing money is a really big deal. And the fact that in the late 7th century, within a period of just a few years, the Islamic Caliph overturns about a thousand years worth of coin tradition, kind of shows this fairly remarkable break in terms of how the Caliphate is presenting itself and for those living under Islamic rule, it literally means every day you're seeing a remarkably different system of symbols than what you and your ancestors are familiar with. Um, and so, yeah, these, these coins are something that really help tell us some of the larger historical changes and context in which our texts are often writing. Other things? Please. Great stuff, thank you, and forgive me for this question. Uh, I'm not a partisan of yeah. Patricia Crone by any yeah. means. It's been about 10 years since I've read Hagarism, but yeah. uh, I have to ask, because I believe she and her uh, colleague were using the, the same set of sources, yeah. but obviously completely different. How, how do you place your own yeah. work? In so it's, it? an, it's, an, it's an excellent question. Um, a recently deceased scholar at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, Patricia Crone, um, she and another scholar from Princeton in the 70s wrote this unbelievably influential book called Hagarism. Um, it's influential despite being kind of impenetrable. That is, it's not an easy read. And I haven't found almost anyone who actually believes its conclusions. But it was absolutely brilliant in what it did is it said if we're going to understand early Islamic history, we need to take serious the earliest sources we have about Islam. And actually, outside of the Quran, our earliest sources about Islam are from non-Muslims. And she did stuff that I couldn't possibly do, which is she was able to mine these sources before other scholars did. And as a result, most people truthfully did not agree with the conclusion she came to about Islamic history. But her method won the day. And almost no one who does early Islamic studies can any more, uh, any longer say we can ignore the Christian sources. Now these sources are horribly biased. They're writing about Islam from the outside. But nonetheless, they're a treasure trove for our understanding of early Islamic history. Um, and so that's in some ways, I think, where the field as a whole positions itself, that we feel unbelievably indebted to this book in terms of its method even if the conclusions it came to have been far from a consensus about early Islamic history. Um, but that's a really great way to kind of situate a project like this 
is without that kind of watershed scholarship, and in this case, watershed and highly controversial, it really wouldn't serve as such a strong impetus for the field. Um, so it's been an amazingly productive moment in the scholarship. Um, are, there, are there any resources that are available for people who are not familiar with Syriac, say a systematic theologian, yep. that would like to easily um, yeah. access the final resources? There's an excellent book edited by uh, Michael Pence. Okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah, no, forgive me. This is self-advertising. -ad um, yeah, so last summer there came out a book um, I t that um, I published titled When Christians First Met Muslims. Um, and what it is is I took all the Syriac sources we have before the year 750. There are about 30 of these sources um, that speak about Islam. Um, and I translated all of them and gave little brief introductions on um, the idea, essentially, to have an entryway for people who were not in the field. Because what I was finding is I didn't have a lot of people to talk to about this. <laughs> um, I actually ran a seminar at Mount Holyoke that was called Early Christian Muslim Relations. I kind of cheated. It should have been called my research. <laughs> and the first day of class, I listed up six names. And I explained to the students, look, he died 100 years ago. He just retired. He won't return my email. He's just mean. I have no one to talk to about this stuff. And so what we are going to do this semester is you will be the seventh through 22nd person to have read this material. And they totally didn't believe me. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks in, they'd read a piece of modern scholarship and say, my gosh, how could that scholar say that given this source, this source, and this source? I have to look at them and say, because they haven't read it. And this is an ongoing uh, issue about Syriac studies and also about Christian Arabic studies, is that many of the things haven't been widely available besides specialists. And even when they are, there's not what I consider the entryway drug. That is the one book that just kind of has it and you can get what you need. Um, so I convinced a press, in this case, University of California Press, that there might be someone like you who might want to read it. So please prove me true. Um, so that gives you kind of the source material. In fact, it's, it's even worse than that, because at the exact same time that came out, yep. also your more analytical book, uh, the, the other okay. book came out, which was called? Um, Envisioning Islam. So that's a, a more of kind of what you saw today, that is trying to synthesize these together. And if you, if you read, read both of them, you'll be very pleased you did. They're both great books. Okay. Thank you. Again, sorry, that, that one's supposed to become self-promotion. But it did. <laughs> yes? Um, this is exactly what we haven't been talking about, yeah. but you mentioned it when you said that there were Syriac Christians in the um, uh, armies. Yes. In the, is, it, is it possible that uh, the great... Ottoman Empire and all of that takeover and everything that, that we label in our in our present day as Islamic terror spreading across the, the known world is little more than either just another takeover by another yet another empire and is it possible to see this without the uh, religious overtones that we give it? Right. That, I mean, one of the large questions of scholars of early Islam is essentially how Islamic is what we call the Islamic conquests. That is, in a time period where you have empires taking over empires, why haven't we called the Byzantine attempt to reconquer Persian territory the Byzantine conquest? And why didn't we call the Persian wrestling of control of Jerusalem as the Persian conquest? Or why didn't we call it the Christian conquest and the Zoroastrian conquest? Mm -hmm. And yet we have this one military event that we instantly give religious inflection to. What interests me is when I look at contemporary sources, that is when I look at early 7th century Christian sources, they have no concern whatsoever that the people have a religion. I mean, I assume they do. We can mention a few things about it, but that's not their mindset at all. That is, for at least the first few decades, what we call the Islamic conquest, for the people who were conquered, seemed to have nothing Islamic for them. Now, that does not mean that the troops did not have religious motivation. It does not mean that Muhammad had religious motivation. But what it means is Christians who were initially under Islamic control kind of looked at it the same thing they looked at when the Persians took them over, 
when the Byzantines took them over, when the Byzantines earlier on took them over. This is kind of a military conquest. But then certain things change, and not the least of which is towards the end of the 7th century, where Islam is being more publicly proclaimed. And at that point, we find Christian sources getting much more interested and concerned about what might be the religious moment. So for them, Islam was not coded as military. That is, the initial conquest is not being coded as religious. It becomes religious as it stays there long enough that you have to worry about what your neighbor actually believes, or the belief of who your daughter is dating. Is that any different, for example, than the imposition of the uh, Roman gods on, the, on everywhere where Rome went? You know, you, well, you I think there is a key difference, yeah. which is that the Islamic Empire never required you to actually worship like a Muslim. In fact, in the earliest century, in the earliest century, it was really hard to convert to Islam. That is, if you were a non-Arab, you were not supposed to be part of Islam. And if you wanted to convert, you first had to change to become an Arab. You had to have a sponsor. You had to lose, lose certain things in society. Islam in the seventh century is certainly not what we would consider a proselytizing religion outside of a very specific ethnic group. And so our Syriac Christians are not in the case of some Christians of the Roman Empire. No one is dragging them in front of a tribunal and saying, if you don't worship Allah or renounce Christ, we're going to kill you. Right. And so that's where I think there is a, a difference there. And again, I don't want anyone to think that this is this kumbaya moment. I'm hoping that some the writings of folks like Pseudo-Methodius can convince us otherwise. But at the same time, it's not analogous to what we would think of as a general religious persecution. Yeah. Um, and that's where these sources, I think, give us more complex models for understanding what's happening in the time period. Um, I'm going to uh, break right there. We're going to take a short uh, a break and have a special table here so we can all sit here. And then we'll resume. So please come prepared with your questions at that point, And we'll have a general discussion and question session. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thanks so much.